Good evening, everyone. We'll be starting in a few minutes as soon as uh, our guest speaker arrives. Oh, I just saw him. I'm here. Okay, Bill, I'm going to make you a co-host, so you should be able to share your screen. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I see it. Okay. Oh, curses, I can't find my printout. So I'm going to do... All right. Okay. Uh, Bill, before we get started, I'm just going to go ahead and read your bio. Um, okay, let me turn my camera on here for a minute. Here. Oh. Okay. Bill, is it Hi, Tony. Hesbach? Hi, Tony. Hesbach, yeah. Hesbach, excellent. So Tony, you're gonna to stay on and handle the chat? I am. Okay, great. That'll be wonderful. Um, and then don't hesitate to interrupt me, please. You know, if you get questions, give them to me because uh, I won't be able to follow the chat. And it makes it it makes it nicer. It's a little bit more interactive. You know, Zoom can be a little bland, but um, but if we're talking to each other a little bit, even during the presentation, it, it works well, I think. Anyway, that's my opinion. I don't know how Excellent. you structured your meetings, but that's okay. No, it's we're pretty flexible. Okay. And forgive me, uh, Bill. I have lost your bio. Oh, here we go. So, uh, for everyone gathered, you've got a good crowd so far. Bill Hesbach is a Connecticut native with a background in engineering. He's an East Eastern Apicultural Society certified master beekeeper and a graduate of the University of Montana's Master Beekeeping Program. Bill operates a sideline business called Wing Dance Apiary in Cheshire, Connecticut, that produces a crop of artisanal honey along with other natural hive products. Bill teaches bee biology and various methods of beekeeping at meetings hosted by Backyard Beekeeping Association and the Connecticut Beekeepers Association. Bill will be joining us for uh, three lectures. Tonight is the first. He's an active member of the Eastern Agricultural Society, where he's part of the Master Beekeeper Certification Program. Bill is a regular guest speaker at local beekeeping seminars in surrounding states and was presented the Distinguished Speaker Award at the 2019 EAS conference. That, that was the last one we could handle before COVID. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Ho ho hopefully uh, it won't be too long of a commute for you next year. <laughs> and we'll be able to meet in person, God willing. Yeah. Bill's interests include uh, beekeeping and queen production and the connection between local flora and bee behavior. Bill is also president of the Connecticut Queen Breeders Cooperative. Bill is a published author and his articles on beekeeping can be found in Bee Culture, Bee Craft, and the American Bee Journal. Thank you for joining us, Bill. And well, thank you for having me. I will stop the chair. You should be able to take over the screen. All right. I'm to get my presentation up first. I'm still seeing you. Okay, I will stop share. And okay. perhaps you will be able to. All right, I'm gonna share my screen. I'll take you off of there. All right, so. Um, let me know what you see there, Tony. I'm gonna um, flip back to um, okay. 
Okay. Uh, I'm going to stop. I see you. See me, yeah. So far, yeah. I'm going to see me. Speaker. Now we see your B. All right. Now you should see yeah. my first. Oh, now let me go back to my first slide. Okay, you should see the wintering colony slide. Is that do you see that? <clears throat> no. No? All right, you will in a minute. <laughs> so just a little bit of perhaps. No, I got it. We're just gonna get you um, on this piece. Here we go. Okay. Yes. And you're seeing right. Okay. All right, now are you seeing just the slide? Yes. Okay, great. All right, so wonderful. So we're um it's a it's a real pleasure to be here tonight. It's um weather's changed here in Connecticut. We're you know now into the um full fall season. Uh, we had our first significant frost Bill, yesterday. Yep. Go ahead. Is somebody asking me something? Yeah, I, I think you're actually in presenter mode right now. So you might want to adjust it to full presentation. Yeah, we see two slides. So you need to go in. Oh, you want? Okay, the, hold on. That's why I asked. So you're just seeing one slide. Okay, so oh, how about sorry. this? What do you see? Excellent. Now? Perfect. Okay, Perfect. Now, now you should just be seeing one slide, right? Correct. Exactly. Okay. Yes. All right. Yeah. I just had to. I didn't know which which way I had to swap to get you to see see that piece. All right. So let me start over. I just wanted to, you know, sort of open up with a little um, um, background of what's going on right in Connecticut with beekeeping at this point. So we're at the point where um, we're, I think, a little still a little bit warmer than you guys. Maybe I'm not sure though. Uh, we're we got our good good frost killed everything except for witch hazel, which is is uh, blooming in some parts of the forest right now. <clears throat> and in my my uh, lot, my bee yard, I have uh, plenty of witch hazel trees that are out, and they'll be out until the end of November. They bloom in a um, strange way, so we, there's still a bloom out. And today, even though everything else has been killed by that hard frost, I was able to see. A bees coming back with the sort of racing stripe of yellow pollen on the back of their uh, torso, the back of their um, thorax. So you could see um, that they're out there foraging against something, you know, if they found something, probably witch hazel. So, well, you know, it's over. Our bee season is, the foraging part of our bee season is actually over, and we're going to get into this picture. Winter time, this is a, this is a uh, little shot I took. Uh, about four or five years back, we had a decent amount of snow. And um, I get a real charge out of people who say, well, we don't insulate our colonies. And, and, and you know, folks that are way up north sometimes talk about this. They say, well, you know, we can get away with just putting tar paper on our colony. And then you see what they do is they shovel snow over the whole thing. <laughs> so, you know, snow is a wonderful insulator. If you look at a um, Typical, if you see the height of the snow on the top of those colonies, that's probably about R15 worth of insulation. So even if I didn't do anything, that particular, those particular colonies are insulated very well. And I'll talk about those colonies later on and what's going on inside those. Those are what I refer to as condensing colonies. They're operating exactly the same way or very close to the way a natural tree colony would work. There's no ventilation in there and just packed with insulation all around and on top as you can see. <clears throat> so let's get started with uh, just talking a little bit about how bees make heat. And this is an <clears throat> infrared photograph of two colonies. The one on the right is one that I removed that insulating sleeve off of so I could use my IR camera to, to locate the position of the cluster. So if you, as you can see here, an, an IR photograph has various degrees of color. And the brighter the color, the warmer uh, the temperature signature is coming off of those, that cluster. And then you can see fairly clearly with the colony on the right, you can see exactly where the center of that cluster is. And you could also see over on the left, 
um, where that cluster is. Now this happens to be two nucleus colonies that are joined together and it turns out that in this case with these nuclear col nucleus colonies, the two colonies sort of merge their clusters together against each other um, right at the division of the two um, colonies and they're keeping each other warm that way, I guess. Um, if they either they just either happen to end up in that configuration or they join that way uh, intentionally, I don't know. But the striking uh, part of this photograph on the left is you'll notice that opposed as opposed to the colony on the right, you can see a lot of energy or IR admission out of the top of the colony. If you look over to the right, you'll notice that in this area here, this area is not giving off as much heat because it's insulated, All right? So insulation works as a way to block heat loss from a colony and there's proof of it here. But I, I also want you to notice down here also. Now, if, you, if you'll just take note of the color pattern, the change from this location all the way down to here, you'll notice that this is very dark, indicating that it's very cold. So one of the basic principles that you'll, um, you could take away from this talk and with some <clears throat> confidence is that by, given, by viewing these IR photographs, that bees do not heat the inside of the box. And so that's, that's part of the beekeeping tradition we talked about that. That's the oral tradition of beekeeping. People will say you got to put them in a smaller box because they, it, it's easier for them to heat. But that's not true. That's just an old beekeeper's tale. Bees do not heat right up below this cluster line, right in here. This temperature will be the same as it is outside. No matter what, how much insulation you put on the bottom of that box, the bees will not insulate, uh, will not heat that part. Okay, so a little bit more proof of what's going on. This is um, some photographs from a friend of mine out in the West Coast, Randy Oliver, who um, <clears throat> wanted to show the, sort of in a more dramatic way what's going on in that cluster. And he's showing you that the center is warm and the outside circle uh, or what we refer to as the mantle is uh, colder. And the way he illustrated this is this is when he first opened the box over here on the left, then he smoked them. And you notice that the bees in the mantle couldn't move, but the bees in the center where they were warmer could get out of the way. So um, you know, that's sort of proof that if you're without the IR evidence, this is a, something you shouldn't do to your colony in the winter, but it's also proof that the center of that um, cluster of bees is warmer. So now when you think about a cluster of bees, make sure you, in your mind, you get your head around the fact that they're not touching. They look like they're one big mass of bees here. But the reality is that there's a frame and a midrib between each of those um, frames inside the colony, all right? So the bees cannot be, con they're not, connected directly and they can't walk from one seam to another one. They have to come up and around or go down and over. And in a um, natural bee colony, it, and I've done a, a fair amount of tree removals, I noticed the first thing you notice is that bees in a tree situation will make a number of winter passages that they use uh, to move between comb segments. Because even though there's not a frame in a natural tree colony, there are seven or eight combs that are hanging and some of them are very long. And it would require that if they were gonna move around in that cluster, they would have to walk a long way to get around them. So they go through the center, they make little winter passages. And there are provisions and frames to do that. And there's actually some beekeepers, back in the day, they would say, you know, like you drill a hole through the center of those frames and for, for winter patches, uh, passages, but if you've ever noticed a plastic frame, you'll notice there's a little triangular shape in the corner. That's for you, that's an option for you to um, break, break out if you wanted your bees to use that as a passage between uh, foundation, like a plastic foundation or something. 
All right, so, uh, so we're gonna talk a little bit about um, heater bees and what they actually do. So heater bees are the bees that find their way to the center of the cluster. And then they put their heads down in cells. And here's what they would look like when they're heating. And here's what they um, look like in the inf this is an infrared photo on the right. And you'll notice that on the right here, there's that would be the midrib right between the two bees. Is my pointer showing up for you guys? Yes, it is. Okay, good. Thank you. Um, so that would be the midrib, and heat would transfer through there, but you don't see much of it. And then this is the bee's thorax. And notice that the bee on the top is in an active shivering mode, or it's, got, it's using its indirect flight muscles to heat. You'll notice that the only warm part on this bee is its thorax and a little bit of its head. Its abdomen is almost completely cold. So, and its wings aren't moving, obviously. If it's down in that cell, its wings can't move. So it's a special uh, configuration that the bees and, and, and neurological signals that the bees send to their mu indirect flight muscles so that they can warm a colony rather than fly away. Now, when we see dead outs, a lot of times, we find bees in this position. And the old, again, the old folklore about this is bees starved and they were going into those cells head down to get the last drop of whatever was in those cells. But you know from your observation of dead outs that you can have a frame like this where there's dead bees in the center and right near them is honey. So when you see that again, realize that bees in a cluster, that's their behavior. There's no honey in the center of a cluster. Right? The honey's on the outside and the bees in the middle are heating. All right, so um, it's, it could be that your bees starved and died with their heads inside cells, but also know that this is the actual natural position of, of heater bees. And if they died because they ran out of food or they chilled to death, they'll end up with heads down in cells anyway. All right, so um, I'm just gonna go over a little bit about how uh, those indirect flight muscles work. They're actually not connected to the wing. So that's an, uh, an extraordinary thing to think about just to begin with. There's a set of horizontal and a set of uh, uh, vertical flight muscles. They're alternatively signaled by the bee's brain. And when that happens, the musculature inside the bee's thorax begins to vibrate the thorax. And in this little gif, it's just showing you that it's pulling it up and down. And that's basically happening, but it happens at, at an incredible rate. This is a very, very slow, um, uh, almost a um, embarrassingly small, slow for bees. This happens at uh, 250 strokes per second. So if you think about that, this, you wouldn't be able to see this um, moving that fast. All right. so. There's a problem with there was a, there's a problem with figuring out flight and how indirect flight muscles work. If you think about the fact that in all musculature, and that includes the muscles in your arms and legs, it takes about five milliseconds for a neurological signal from the breeze brain to get back to its muscles to activate it. So in the case of flying insects that wouldn't be good enough because some insects can beat their wings at 1400 beats per second. Bees are around somewhere between 230 and 250. <clears throat> if you divided that five milliseconds into a thousand milliseconds, which, which, is, which are in a second, then what you would get is uh, a possible movement of those muscles at, at 200 beats per second. But we already know that um, bees wings beat at a much higher rate than 200. So, so how's that accomplished? Well, the musculature, in, the indirect flight muscles are uh, what they refer to as stretch activated. It's more like a guitar string. Once they're activated by a neurological signal, they can carry through and continue to work until another signal comes along. So it's sort of like a vibration. 
Now, um, that took a while for scientists to figure out, and, but they finally did. This is a, um, a dissection that I did, and you can see the thorax here. Oops. This is the section of the thorax. This is the scutellum. Now, when you nick this with your dissecting tool, uh, a bunch of clear fluid pours out of it, hemolymph. So that's, that's where some hemolymph is stored. And what, what that allows is, this is a, a buffer for when the, when, think about it as like a shock absorber for when the thorax is moving up and down to um, move the wings in that indirect fas fashion that I showed you in the last GIF. And what happens is for bees to use their musculature so that they're not flying, they lock, they set, they send, initially they send a special signal to their indirect flight muscles and they lock that scutellum in a position that does not allow the thorax to move. So the thorax is in what we refer to as um, tetanus. So it's a state like, 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 like lockjaw. Your muscles are tense, but they can't move. Or anytime that you've got a charley horse, it's basically the same thing that a bee does to induce its direct, indirect flight muscles into generating heat. It tenses them and keeps sending signals to them. They vibrate, but the thorax can't move, but the heat is generated. All right. There's a, just to show you what they look like, this is another dissection of mine. There's, of course, the um, vertical muscles and then the horizontal musculature going all the way through the thorax. I think that um, that the indirect flight muscles, most, there's a honeybee, as you already know, is, is absolutely fascinating in a number of ways. But one way that's particularly fascinating is this musculature, this structure here. These muscles are used, uh, have this energy ratio that's higher than a professional athlete. They use more energy than any animal musculature in the, in the world. But of course, it's a little bee, so it's not a whole lot of energy, but on, um, you know, in, in, in relation to other musculature. And they also serve the purpose of gathering everything the colony needs. So the indirect flight muscle is responsible for all of the action for a bee outside the colony and all of the heating and um, and cooling of everything that goes on inside the column. All right, so let's talk a little bit about the temperatures of a, of a winter cluster. And if you'll notice in this photograph here, you can see the queen there, she's right there. This is the center of the cluster. This line right here is basically one of these frames right in the middle. And I'm just basically repeating things I've already said to you. But um, if you look at the temperature range, you're looking at about 104 degrees. Some bees are at 104 degrees um, in this area here in the middle of a cluster. And then as you get toward the edge of the cluster, you see that line where below 43 degrees, you know, it's the same. It's about an inch from there. It's about the same as the outside world. But you will note that some of these bees are being are heating up to incredible rates. So that would be um, um, almost 40 degrees Celsius. So that's a very, very high temperature. When bees, when heater bees approach that temperature, they need to cool down. All right. So the way a cluster actually works is we used to think that all the bees in the center of the cluster stop generating heat, but that's actually not the case. It's, it's, a, it's a property that emerges. The heat generation and distribution inside a cluster emerges from the fact, the distribution of the heat emerges from the fact that the bees in the center of the cluster overheat and need to get to the outside and cool down. And in, in that case, they have to find their way to the outside, causes action in the cluster, 
And then other bees that are cooler are also looking for ways to get into the cluster to warm up. So think about that whole sort of transition of bees from the center to the outside and then from the outside again back to the center. So that happens all the time and it happens naturally because the bees in the center of the cluster in order to even reach 95 degrees in that cluster, they have to overheat themselves to do that. So, um, cause they're fighting against the um, ambient cold, right? Um, and I showed you, this is a, this is a, this, you have A here, that's the center of the cluster. C is somewhere out in this area here. So just to show you that you're looking through Bs, it's, you're seeing a little bit of heat in the background, but then again, just to illustrate the point that the bees on the outside of the mantle in, in this area here in the mantle are cooler than, um, than the bees in the center. All right, let's move on. All right, just some uh, interesting things about bees uh, in inside of a cluster. And you, you'll see this if you, if you do any kind of um, dissection of bees and you have to get back through and get a clear thorax, you have to shave those hairs off. And the hairs on the cluster, on the outside of a bee's thorax or on the thorax at all are bifurcated. It's like, and they act like a bird down. So when bees are pressed together in a cluster, like you see here, a part of their thorax touch, and there might be bees on top of them even or, or around them. So in a way, every element or every characteristic of a bee's body is in, in the cold, in a temperate area, is working toward conserving heat. All right, so um, I just thought that this is, and by the way, I, this is probably the point where I should have said this earlier, but if you wanna learn more about anything I'm talking about, there's, um, there's scientific references down at the bottom. Most of what I show you will not be my opinion um, until the end, then I'll give you some of my opinions. But in this area here, I've researched all of this uh, stuff for, um, if, you know, if you, in case you don't want to for your benefit. And um, then, <clears throat> but you can look through a lot of this uh, stuff. And, and if you want those references, I'll provide them and you can go look for yourself. It's, it's fascinating um, reading. All right, and then the other one that um, this is, I added this particular slide just to get this out of the way because there's, I've run into this, occasionally run into this argument or questioning about what's better for heat loss. And what would be better for bees to winter on? Would it be better for them to winter on wax comb or on um, plastic? And is plastic not good for them to winter on? And you can see a difference between the combs. You can see that the midrib of a wax comb is very thin. Usually I slice this with my... Uh, chop saw, and you can see that the bees can get very close, right? Their, their head is here, and another bee's head would be here, and their thorax would be here, and the thorax would be there. So they can trans, you know, they can, uh, there's thermal, what they refer to as thermal conductivity. The material conducts heat at a certain rate. It's calculated, it's a big formula. I'll save you the uh, angst. And, but the number that you come up with for wax is dot four one. So what that thermal conductivity number is telling you is that wax conducts heat at dot four one. So the question is, is there any difference between the thermal conductivity of a wax midrib or a plastic midrib? So I looked for um, HDPD, PE, high density poly, Flint and um, found that the thermal conductivity is about the same, right? So, so for wintering purposes, there's really no difference between a wax and plastic. Um, the bee's heads are a little bit farther away in, in the plastic, but it makes no difference from a, from a uh, material standpoint. So rest assured, the bees are okay. If you're using natural foundation, 
and a naturally drawn cone or, um, or plastic. All right, so, and this, this might not be new to you. Some of this stuff is uh, pretty much uh, well known. It's the outer, outer mantle, lower limit is approximately 40, let's say 43 degrees. And after 43 degrees, bees go into what we refer to as a chill coma. Now, I get in trouble with this every once in a while. And about three years ago, I got in big trouble with it because I, I look at my colonies during the winter and, and um, make sure they're okay, make sure I have a cluster and all of that. Uh, I don't do it often, but I do make sure that my bees are alive. And I did pull a box thinking it was dead and because all of the bees were still, nobody was moving. And I put it down in my, I, didn't, I couldn't get to my garage. There was too much snow in my bee house. So I put them all in, um, in the basement. Where does he live? Too much snow in Connecticut. Okay, so we're gonna have to, we're gonna have to mute that. Well, I think last year they did get with snow. Can we mute that person? Tony, can you mute them? Okay, thank you. Um, so, uh, you know, so once I got them in the basement, the next day I got down, there's a thousand bees flying around my, my garage, you know, success. They were only in a chill coma. They can last in a chill coma for about 50 hours or so, and maybe even longer. I've picked up bees in flowers at the edge of, um, or the end of fall and put them in my hand, blow through it, blow on them for a while. And there you can see that they start to shiver. And two minutes later, their wings are moving and they could fly away. So chill coma is a real thing. You'll see it sometimes in front of your colonies. Um, so make sure you're, if you go to your colonies in the winter and you think they're dead, make sure they're dead <laughs> before you bring them inside. So if there's no brood in a colony, the colony doesn't waste its time with a lot of heat generation. So if you look at the charts and we have plenty of data that supports this, that the inner core temperatures of a broodless colony, which might be uh, for me, I'll be totally broodless probably uh, in a couple of weeks. Some of my colonies right now are, are absolutely broodless, but, um, but they'll all be broodless in a very short period of time. And they don't maintain the temperature at 95 degrees when there's no brood. So they'll run around 70 degrees and because um, they don't need to have it any hotter than that. And 70 degrees is fine for them to survive with. But then around the first of the year, right around the equinox, around the, excuse me, around the uh, winter solstice, they, they start a little bit of brood. The queen starts laying a little circle and she'll lay all through January and February. And then as soon as there's a significant amount of brood, the brood nest temperature ends up going around 95 degrees. And then I already discussed uh, this difference between how how the mantle and the and the core works in terms of changing places for body temperature reasons. So, if you do put a brood minder or some other device in your colony and you watch the core temp, or you watch temperature of the colony go below ninety five degrees, it's not because that colony is dead, unless it keeps going down and it ends up going down to ambient temperature. But um, if it stays around seventy, it's just because there's no brood in that colony yet. All right, but I do want to emphasize that bees, and as I, I, I mentioned this earlier, they have the highest mass specific me metabolic rates ever measured. And, um, but that has a consequence. When you're burning glycogen at that level, that's what, they're, that's what they use for a, or triolose, whichever, however you wanna say it, but it's, um, it's a sugar that's in their hemolymph. And then that's what they use to burn uh, muscle, muscle. That's what they use to burn uh, energy in their muscle cells. So if, you're, if, you're, uh, if you have that kind of high metabolic rate, the musculature oxidizes really fast. Now, if, and, we're, and this is an important issue 
for those of us who choose not to insulate, but instead ventilate our colonies in the winter. You just have to know that um, your heater bees will sacrifice their life for the colony to keep it warm. But it's not, you know, it's not a free lunch when they're heating up at that sort of survival level of heat, their muscles oxidize. And there are some folks that will tell you that a bee in the center of a cluster that's forced to produce lots of heat, for even for a brief period of time, will shorten its lifespan. And that more bees will die in a colony that's, say, subjected to a lot of winter ventilation. Even though the colony may survive and come into the spring, it doesn't mean that the bees that were in that colony didn't have to put an extraordinary effort forward to keep that colony alive all winter. And they pay for it by dying sooner in the spring. All right, so, um, so how does heat get out of a colony? So I'm gonna talk about the three ways and these are three ways that heat moves around in your house. Um, this, these are three ways that, that heat <clears throat> moves everywhere. All right, so this is all, this is just basic fluid dynamics. This is how it works. All right, you got conduction when two things are touching and that's from contact. Then you have convection, which is um, heat loss from air currents. And then, and then you have radiant heat loss. And this infrared picture is radiant heat. So that comes from the bee's bodies. They call, they call that a warm body loss. If I was to take your picture, your head, your face in a cold winter day, your face would be um, a bright color and your head especially where you lose about 90% of your um, heat would be red or yellow, which would indicate that you're, you, have, you have a lot of radiant heat loss out of your head. All right, so any, any body that generates heat can lose heat in, in these three ways. All right, so we're not, we really can't do much about conduction, um, but we can do something about um, convective heat loss. And that's the one that I'll sort of focus on as we move forward through the rest of these slides. But convective heat loss is um, one of the easiest things for us to control in a colony. And um, it's easy for the bees to actually manage convective heat currents inside the colony also. They're, uh, they're totally adapted to be able to manage all the convective heat loss in the colony. And they do it in a very specific way. And I wanna talk to you about that tonight, so I will in a minute. Radiant heat loss, not much we can do about that, but there is um, an interesting uh, phenomena with one of the insulation products out there that will allow you to actually use reflect some radiant heat back onto the bees' bodies. I'll show you that in, at the end. All right, so um, why is it that we always say that cluster size matters when we're going into the winter? And that when we get below four seams of bees, say for instance, you're in a danger zone where that cluster has uh, not a lot of uh, potential to make it through the winter. And that's why there's this old adage that's passed around from beekeeper to beekeeper that says, take your losses in the fall, combine colonies. And when you do that, you increase the size of, or you increase the amount of bees in that colony, you end up with a larger winter cluster. And there's a relationship between the amount of volume in the core of a cluster and its surface area. And I just want to show you that, right? And this is no mystery to the natural world. You know, natural world is attuned to this. Dogs and, and this little cat, they all know the principle. If you look at these two objects, I mean, two cats, you would, you will notice that the one on the, on the left is battling the cold with its surface area exposed 
and the one on the right uh, has curled to protect its core. So if you look at these two cats, you see that this is the area on the cat on the right that, he, that, needs, to, that needs to be worn, well, including its head, but that's the part. And this cat could never last on a cold winter night or even a cold day in this posture. It would have to do something to conserve heat. You see dogs do this all the time. They, they walk around in circles until they fall down and curl up into a ball. That's all to conserve their core uh, temperature. And they know that their exposed surface area, which will give off a lot of heat, um, they know they have to minimize that by curling up into a ball and keeping warm. All right, so you're not gonna have to do this math. I did it for you, but I just wanna talk a little bit. By the way, this whole thing was about conductive heat loss, right? Wind going on that um, cat, right? So that's all conductive heat loss. So, or convective, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I said conductive, I meant convective heat loss. So just to give you an example of what I mean by the difference between the core and the surface area. If you look at a 10 inch cluster, right, we're gonna say that the 10 inch cluster is 314 square inches, right? That's the surface area of it. Now you just, it's a simple formula. It's down below in that little ball. You can, uh, you can do your own math if you, if you don't, uh, if you wanna prove this out for yourself. And the mass, the core mass, of a 10-inch cluster is 523 square inches. So in a 10-inch cluster, the mass, the amount of bees in the center, the, you know, the mass of the bees' bodies in the center is 400, it's 40 percent larger than the surface area, right? So if you're thinking about convective heat loss, more of the core is protected in a larger cluster, and the surface area is um, 40%, 40%, 60% smaller than the core's mass. I just reversed the numbers on it. But if you look at when that cluster shrinks down to five inches, then the core, the surface area of the five inch cluster is 79 square inches and the mass of the five inch cluster is 65 inches. And so if you look, the numbers have reversed, right? So the whole point of going over all these numbers is to illustrate that the core's mass shrinks disproportionately. And that's the thing you have to protect to keep a cluster alive. In the case of a 10 inch cluster, it's 40% larger the mass. In the case of a five inch cluster, it's 21% smaller than the surface area. So in a five inch cluster, what this translates to is you lose, you lose more heat quicker than with a 10 inch cluster, all right? So that's why we say, start off with a large um, amount of bees in the winter time if you wanna get them through. All right, so now some of you might be familiar with this lava lamp from the 60s. I, don't, I never saw one back then, but I've, I've heard that this is how they work staring at them for hours and hours. I know my friends did, but I never did. You know that I never did that. Um, but uh, this is Archimedes principle and convection. This is how convection flows in a lava lamp. You probably didn't realize this when you were looking at them back in the day, but <clears throat> there's wax in them. And that bulb underneath heats, heats the wax up. The heat goes, um, the wax ball or bubble goes up to the top. And then uh, as the wax cools, it comes back down again. That's a convective flow, all right? And that occurs inside of a colony, right? There's a convective flow inside of a colony. The same exact thing happens in the lava lamp. The heat source is a bulb below the lava lamp. <clears throat> in a cluster, the heat source is the bees generating heat, the heater bees in the center of that uh, core. All right, this is a little bit more complicated uh, look at it. This is one of Randy's uh, <clears throat> more complicated diagrams. But anyway, you'll see the center 
of the brood nest. He has it here um, at 90 and 95%. You see the hot air is rising off this cluster. Oxygen and humidity fall downward. Um, CO2 accumulates in the center. Heat rises. It's given off. And then the, the air cools and falls back down. So I'm going to show you in a little bit a natural tree colony. And you can see, I'll show you how this works in a natural tree colony. But this is occurring inside the colonies in your yard right now. All right, this whole convective current takes place. The center core is heated, the heat rises, it goes out of the insulating shell, gets cooler, falls down along the side and out the bottom. All right, so we're at the point where I'm going to introduce, um, since we know how convective current, currents work, uh, we know what's heating the colony and um, so now I'm going to get into this part of the discussion where I want to introduce the two kinds of colonies that are possible for you to manage. Like lots of colonies out there are what we refer to as ventilators. And I'm going to I'll show you, I'll bring you through what a ventilator is. And then there's also condensing colonies. So I've written here that a ventilator is used by most industrial and some backyard beekeepers. It ventilates, it vents out all of the metabolic moisture, gases, and heat, All right? So that's what a ventilator colony does. And you've heard the stories. You have to provide ventilation for bees in the winter because if you don't, they'll, uh, the cold, their hot air will meet that cold cover. The moisture will condense on it and fall back down on the bees as liquid moisture. We all know that bees cannot survive being wet. They can survive being cold. They do regularly in Canada where it's 40 or 30 below or 20 below, but they can't survive being cold and wet. And we're condensing colony, which is the what I'm going to, what I'm introducing to you in this talk, or maybe you know about it already. I'm saying it's used by nature and some backyard beekeepers. Now what it does, what a condensing colony does is it, it mimics what a natural bee colony what occurs in the natural bee colony in a tree. And it conserves all the metabolic moisture that's generated versus venting it out. It also conserves the gases and it conserves the heat in special ways. And I'll show you how that's all done. And then it uses the CO2 that's generated to regulate the cluster's metabolic rate. Now, the interesting part about the way that the center of this cluster works is when these bees are respirating, they're generating CO2. Now, CO2 is not a gas that if it accumulates in any area is good for living organisms because you can get, that's why we have CO2 detectors in our homes. We all know that we can get poisoned by it. You get into um, hypoxia which is a lack of oxygen to be replaced by CO2, you're gonna, uh, you can die from it, right? You can die in your sleep from it. It'll kill you, it's a silent killer. So we put those CO2 detectors in our house. So for uh, vertebrates and folks that are, and people that have lungs like we have, or, or animals that have lungs and, but for insects, it's a little bit different. So for an insect, especially those that are adapted to work in temperate, to live in temperate climates like bees, they can use the CO2 to regulate their metabolic rate, right? So they change it and they get into what is referred to as an ultra low metabolic rate. And so when bees are hypoxic in their cluster, it doesn't kill them. They just change the way their metabolism works and they can conserve energy, All right? So that's a big difference between running a cluster under a condensing arrangement, allowing bees to regulate their hive gases naturally and shooting them all out of the top vent. It's a very different way of approaching beekeeping. I think you'll agree that, um, uh, that that's a striking difference actually. The way, and the way bees actually survive are as condensing. They have, have grown to be able to do a condensing colony, that's what they do. We, us, us beekeepers, 
are the ones that have um, decided that they need to be in ventilating colonies, right? So, and I explained all of this before, so I'm just gonna go right by this one. But um, here it is, the hot air coming up. This would be a ventilating hive. Nice convective flow, hot air comes up, cold, dry air comes in, it meets, the liquid moisture falls down. And uh, as I said, bees can't tolerate um, that kind of wet and cold. And then, and then, so the industry got behind a lot of this and noted that bees, keepers, like to ventilate colonies in the wintertime. And like, if there's a good reason to ventilate a colony, if you, especially if you don't insulate it, because it will kill the colony if you don't have a vent. And your colony can survive in a ventilating mode. I'm just suggesting that it's probably a little stressful for bees to do. But here's the interesting ways. This is just a standard old uh, inner cover with a Porter bee escape hole and a little notch. And some folks will run their colony like that. They put wedges under there, they lift the cover so that they get this stream of hot air to come out of the cluster and go out the little hole. And uh, it does keep the colony dry inside, but it's also, um, as I mentioned, expensive from a metabolic rate. Then there's these sort of like, I guess you would fill this with some kind of insulation, maybe a cloak board or something like that. Um, I mean, uh, cotton baling or leaves or I don't know what, people put lots of things inside these cloak boards to make it um, a moist, they wanna catch the moisture first and then they wanna ventilate it out, All right? So there's slots inside of this. It's not, if you put slots near your insulation, of course it affects the insulator quality of this. So there's really not much insulation in this kind of board. There's another version of a cloak board. This one's an extreme one, you know, all kinds of holes drilled in it. You know, this is a person who is living in an area where um, they're thinking they need a lot of ventilation to get their colonies through the winter. But of course, um, uh, up in Canada, they don't do this, right? So they, um, they bury their colonies in snow, a lot of them. And then here's the one, here's a nice one. This is a Ukrainian uh, beehive and they have some kind of a bottle coming. It's, there's a bottle down here that catches something. I really don't know. I just was fascinated by the fact that they have some, um, this is EPS, foam insulation. So they're doing something to um, uh, catch, maybe there's bees are making, maybe this is a flow hive and the, and the bees are uh, putting uh, honey through that all during winter. I don't know, but I just thought it was kind of cool. This is the way you do it in Ukraine. And this is my favorite. This is a solar ventilator, this particular one. A little bit of burlap, and then they have some computer fans in there, a little controller and a solar panel. And if the sun's shining, those little fans work and they're blowing, uh, drawing uh, cold air up through the colony to ventilate it out. All right, so ventilating colony, lots of way to accomplish that. I'm not suggesting that um, your bees will die if you ventilate them. Colonies that have been ventilated for a very long period of time. Um, in my area where I live, um, I run condensing colonies. I will run in a ventilator occasionally, but I know when I'm gonna run a, a ventilator colony, I have to have a lot of food on that colony all winter long, all right? So, um, so then the contrast is um, with a condensing colony. Now. This is a little book that you can get on the internet. It's free because it's over hundred years old. And this was by Ed Clark. This is a beekeeper that first began to try to socialize this idea of allowing your bees to work in a condensing colony. And he began to socialize this way back in the early 1900s. And he ran condensing colonies for about 50 years. Now, I built one of his prototypes and ran it a couple of years. It was a very complicated colony to build, <clears throat> but I did it and um, it seemed to work fine, but you know, it didn't do anything that, that an insulated colony would do. But anyway, he thought that the bees are trying to tell us something, you know, they, they're contending that condensation is the best system adapted to their mode of life. While we're trying to force them into a ventilation system, and that's what we do, a lot of us. And he had some hope, Clark did, 
that us being reasonable people will see the error of our ways and eventually follow where the bee leads. And then that gets onto these series. Is the bee leading us into some place telling us that they might want to be controlling ventilation and not, not allowing a lot in? And this is what I see a lot of times uh, with my colonies. In this case, um, this is combination of propolis and wax. And this occurred in the end of the summer near the fall. And if you notice, if you try to crack open any inner cover at this point, the bees have propolized it really down tight. And if they uh, are prone to doing it, they will block that port of bee escape hole against the top of the inner cover, right? So uh, that's an indication to me that the bees are saying, we want to control the airflow in this case, right? The insects are gone. There's no, re this wasn't there during the summer. So they did this uh, at the end of the season to try to do something to manage um, the airflow. <clears throat> now I had a hole in this colony uh, for some reason. And um, I put some number eight hardware cloth over it. They immediately closed it off. Now um, I'm gonna suggest that they're closing this as in preparation to make certain that they can control the gases in the colony. They also don't want insects and other critters going in there. So they probably close this one for um, other reasons, but just to let you know, they will propolize almost anything uh, they can, especially as you get toward fall and particularly when you get toward fall. And you've maybe you've seen this. I saw this in other countries. I've seen it in um, um, <clears throat> uh, different um, European beekeeping models. And this is a place, and in my own apiary, I've seen them propolize the front entrance so you could hardly get a single bee through, right? So um, they make an attempt to control um, the size of openings and the air that flows into the colony. And uh, why? Because they're very good at being able to control the gases. All right, so, um, so maybe they are trying to tell us something. Maybe they are trying to say, hey, we're good at this. We know what we're doing. Uh, we propolize our all, we seal up all of the cracks and everything in the colony before we go into winter. You know, we'll, we'll propolize the seams of the boxes that you put on. We'll propolize the inner cover down if we can. We'll do all of that because we want to be able to control um, anthropomorphizing bees at this point, <laughs> which um, is a crime actually, but <clears throat> they're working on instinct because they're gonna be able to manage the hive gases better on their own. All right, so now um, a natural condensing colony, uh, I'll show you what's happening. So in a natural condensing colony, this is a tree and they'll have honey stored up here. Now a tree, if you'll notice, has almost an infinite amount of insulation above it and almost an infinite amount of insulation, even though the R value of wood is not great, there's so much of it in a tree that they have plenty above and below. And then also surrounding the colony is wood. Sometimes three inches thick, some of the logs or tree, bee trees that I've cut open had four or five inches of wood around them. Some of them had two or three, but suffice to say that this entire colony is surrounded by gobs and gobs of insulation. And Tom Seeley and I have had this discussion um, at April Monday last year and on various occasions. And, and uh, he, he let me use this little picture of his and he's, he was also totally convinced that insulation plays a, um, a big part in the way that natural bee colonies have adapted to temperate living conditions. Now you'll hear people say that you can't put, you know, insulation on too early. My bees will die. They won't know what temperature it is outside. And if you insulate heavily, what will happen is um, bees will miss the, um, uh, the temperature changes and it won't come out for cleansing flights. All of that is just, I'm sorry to say, um, dogma about beekeeping from people who may not have had the advantage that I've had to run tests or studies where I've run colonies uninsulated and colonies that were insulated and observed exactly when they emerged 
on days when the temperature came up to flight temperature so that they could go out and cleanse in the winter time. And I noticed that there's absolutely no difference between whatever it is that signals to bees, and my guess is outside air temperature coming in through the colony, whatever it is that signals them, they get that signal whether or not they're heavily insulated or not insulated at all, all right? So, um, and, they all, and they come out just about at the same time. And they stay out just about the same length of time and they go back in just about the same time. So uh, you could run an insul colony insulated all year long and you'll, you'll notice that there's lots of products on the market now that are encouraging that. You know, styrofoam colonies, EPS colonies, all kinds of colonies that uh, people run all year long as heavily insulated colonies. All right, we've been over this. Um, this is just how the convective flow works. And again, in a tree colony, the moisture is condenses on the, on the surfaces over here. The convective currents are taking place. Warm air is rising against all of this insulation, this surface is warmed and stays warm. There's no uh, cooling effect on this surface. The air finds it's the hot air is attracted toward a cooler surface. It go, keeps going down till it finds the cooler legs along the side of the colony. And then that becomes liquid moisture at that point. It condenses out. Now, when bees are in a colony in a tree, and this convective currents are occurring, what happens is when those, the hot moist con conden condensation hits the cooler surface, the water droplet gives off latent heat, right? So that's the process. And that, sometimes I, when I'm in front of audiences, when I ask this, there's invariably people will know, and there's probably a few of you that already knew that when uh, condensation turns into liquid moisture, it gives off heat. That's the only way it can, that's the physical property of thermodynamics that has to happen. So in a naturally condensing colony, there's a source of heat that they get from their own metabolic moisture. It's not a tremendous amount of heat, but it's something. And then the water droplets will stay on those outside cones. Some of them find their way down to the bottom but then there, that water is available for the bees to use when they need to thin honey, whenever they, the temperature is right outside, when they can take a cleansing flight, cleansing flight, and then they come in and relocate around some more honey that they need to uncap and eat. They have a source of liquid moisture droplets, very small droplets on the sides of those combs that they can scoop up and use without having to go out of the colony to find moisture which is dangerous in the wintertime, as you know. Bees die on your um, inner cover. Um, they die on your top cover. They die in the snow out in front of the colonies. Lots of things happen to them when they go out for water during the winter. All right, so that's the way that that uh, condensed, the convection works for a little bit of heat recovery um, in a natural colony. All right, now this is uh, Lloyd Harris's photograph. And this was a winter in, um, an, uh, in an uninsulated hive. Now, after um, Lloyd wrote this article back in 2017, um, he, from then on, always made sure that he insulated. This is earlier in the season. He insulated his colonies very early to make sure that this didn't occur. If you'll notice that if you get a colony, really, really large colony, really robust and strong, and you put it in an uninsulated box, just a wooden migratory cover, and you let it heat, there's no liquid moisture. The condensation never gets out to the edges and falls down. It freezes as what they refer to as hoar frost. And that's what you're seeing around the edge there, right? It'll actually condense and freeze into hoar frost and grow. That hoarfrost will grow all the way down side, not all the way down the inside of the box. Now it's only 32 degrees. So if your outside temperature is lower than that, it's not damaging to the colony, but it's, uh, you know, you got the colony in a total emergency mode at that point. Lloyd insulated 
after he, um, if you read his article, you'll see where he's trying to illustrate with this that insulation is actually a very good thing to have. Now, this is also um, a insulated top cover. And I'm trying to illustrate here the difference between Lloyd's photograph and mine. This is one of my covers. Notice this center is clear. So this is right, this is the middle of the winter, right over the top of a cluster, a B cluster. And the cluster is right around this size at this point, maybe seven or eight frames. Notice how clear this, this is versus this area where you can begin to see how the moisture, how the hot air spread out across that foil insulation. And that's one inch, that's one inch thick foil. And condensed on the outside where it's harmless. No moisture over the center and moisture on the edges. And if you look down in this colony, you would see that there was moisture on the inside walls and down um, along. And if you had a solid bottom board on, there'd be some moisture on the solid bottom board also. All right, so, um, so that's how it works with insulation, right? Nice clear center, no opportunity for liquid moisture to fall back down on the bees and a nice area of reserve moisture for the bees to come up and lick off or get off the sides of combs that are closer to them in the cluster. All right, so um, let's talk a little bit. I, I've gone over this pretty much. So I'm just gonna, I wanna make sure that you understand I'm not um, suggesting that the ventilator colonies are, are um, something you shouldn't do. I just want to uh, illustrate the differences, right? So this is a ventilator. And I'm saying that the minuses for a ventilator colony is that it vents out heat, gases, and moisture because um, that's what you want to do with it, right? That's what you're trying to do. But I'm saying that as a minus because I think the bees use that in a condensing colony. And it requires a large reserve of winter honey. Now, I think that, um, when we first began to ventilate colonies, and believe me, I ventilated colonies for a very, very long time. So um, I knew that to get my colonies through the winter, I need large reserves of honey. Now you'll hear beekeepers tell you, you need a hundred pounds. And, and if you look at what is capable, what bees are capable of being able to use over three months in a very cold winter, it's about 23 pounds of honey. That's all they need for their own metabolic use. And so, and if you found bees that were dead in the winter time, um, in the spring even, and you notice there's this a large amount of bees dead on the bottom board and then bees with their heads down in cells and then right next to them is more honey. You'll note that they, you know, you can say so, well, they didn't starve, they had a lot of honey. They might've died from something else, viruses or something, but, even a colony that comes through winter that you started with 100 pounds of honey, I have never seen a colony eat 100 pounds of honey during the winter time. There's always combs on the side that have never been touched because they just come, they raise right through the center of that uh, honey reserve and they eat it as they need to. They keep coming up and um, they don't go out to the sides if they don't have to. And they, there's always some combs on the side. Maybe you guys, um, there's somebody that has a, that knows of an exception, but um, I've never seen a colony that I started off with, with nine or 10 frames of honey in the top come through with none at all. So my belief is that we have come to believe that these, or, or have a passed down the message that we need a lot of honey because, because of ventilation. It's um, not, um, not because the bees need it. So it can put the cluster into constant survival mode by cooling it constantly with a stream of cold air. Um, small clusters die faster and heater bees suffered from oxidative stress. But the pluses are it will keep a colony dry. It may help um, with the winter die off of pests like small hive beetle, wax moth. Um, um, by the way, um, I don't know how about, about you folks, but small hive beetles are here to stay in my apiary. Um, I did what I could this year, but over the last two years, small hive beetles have really grown to be 
um, a pest I have to deal with a lot. And um, so that's terrible. But anyway, it's happening. Um, there's lots of available equipment and there's lots of history. And there's lots of oral tradition that will confuse the hell out of most beekeepers because every beekeeper out there has his own way of ventilating a colony. And it gets very confusing and it's extremely confusing to new beekeepers. So how you do it um, is a personal preference. And then it works well with large clusters. So those are the pluses. Now in the condensing colony, the minuses are that it requires a modification of equipment to include a lot of uh, insulation, especially on top. And then it's not intuitive to beekeepers because we don't, you know, we're not, we have, we don't have the customs of doing it. And then, um, it's, so it's contrary to our common understanding of management. So that's what uh, my friend Ed Clark was battling was the whole sort of dogma around can I run a condensing colony? It's not part of our current colony management strategy. And then it's, um, the pluses are it's a natural way to keep bees. It requires less honey for overwintering and it reduces the survival stress, I'm saying, because of this ultra low metabolic rate. Bees in, a, in hypoxia go into that condition and it's not stressful to them. It helps them prolong their lives. And I'm gonna be bold enough to say it reduces winter losses. I have very good survival. All of my production colonies that I use for honey production are uh, run as condensing colonies. They do not, you know, lots of, lots of insulation around a colony will not make mold occur inside of a colony. Um, um, it will be moist in there, but mold doesn't grow as long as the colony is alive. The colony dies, then mold will grow. But if a colony dies anytime, mold will grow inside the colony. And there are years, which I've um, not been able to explain yet with data, but from anecdotal, my anecdotal uh, experience tells me that there's years when no matter what kind of colony you have, there's lots of mold in them. Maybe it's the way the uh, humidity was during the winter time or whatever it is, but there's years where we get mold and years where we don't. And in the, in the years where we get a little bit of mold on the outside frames, you get them in colonies that are condensing or you get them in colonies that are not. So, you know, I don't see the difference, but some people do. Now, um, if you wanted to try to insulate one of your colonies and make it into one of these condensing colonies, um, some things you should know about uh, uh, what is and what isn't insulation, but I wanted to just illustrate to you the difference between you know, the amount of insulation around a natural colony. This is actually um, a tree I cut down and this was a, a colony in this, in this uh, uh, tree. This was a bee tree and I cut this section out of it um, <clears throat> and brought it to my apiary and put it on that stand and ran it like that for a couple of years until um, it swarmed out and uh, it didn't survive a winter. And now there's about four to seven times heat loss between this tree, bee tree, and this box. So this is, can be four to seven times less efficient, right, than this tree trunk, just to begin with. So that's just something that you wanna keep in mind. You can see this illustration. Right? There's, how could a little thin box compete with the insulation on a, on a tree that size? And most bees are in trees like that size. Okay, so what's insulation? All right, so insulation is um, a material that has the ability to resist heat. And I want you to notice that um, missing from this is tar paper. And I wanna be specific about tar paper so that you understand that tar paper is not insulation. And um, so some people call, I, I saw a wonderful bee talk by, um, person I respect up in Vermont. He's been keeping bees up there for a very, very long time. He's got, um, you know, a lot of notoriety in the bee community. And he calls one of his wraps a solar wrap and he puts tar paper on it. Now, um, <clears throat> and I was curious because the next slide that he showed was his crew shoveling snow up and mounding it on all four sides of the 
of the hive. So um, there's really no solar gain when you put tar paper on the outside of a colony. It will act as a windbreak, but nothing else. It doesn't have enough mass as a product to transfer heat through a three quarter inch board. And then it would have to meet, by the way, a honeycomb, which has a, a tremendous amount of resistance against heat, like R15. So you can't move heat from tar paper into the cluster. You'll never heat the inside of the box up. This doesn't work that way. So the best I think is the foil faced polyisocyanurate. It's called R-Max. It's um, sold at the big box stores. Uh, there's plenty of names for it. It's about R7 per inch. The next is uh, expanded polystyrene, which is stuff that they make coffee cups out of. That has about R5 per inch. And then humuso, which is the worst thing. I think this is the worst thing you could put in your colony. Um, that's, and I'm opinionated about this because, and I've, because I've discussed this with the humuso manufacturers at some length because they were discouraged by this article I wrote uh, back in, um, 2016, March of 2016 in bee culture. And you can look that up. Um, if somebody could look it up and put the link in the chat, you can go read more about this. Um, but homoso, first of all, has borax in it. Now that's because homoso was designed to be put inside wall cavities for soundproofing. So it needed to resist insects. So they put an insecticide in it. So Unfortunately, we've adapted homoso as a way to collect moisture. And people will tell you that it has insulation value too, but I have to tell you it has less than one R. And it, because it's a cellulose fiber, it collects moisture from your colony coming off of the um, hot air, convective air that's rising. As soon as the surface of homoso gets saturated and it gets, the whole board will get saturated very quickly. It has absolutely no R value at that point because it's basically water molecules touching each other, but it acts as a, as a heat sink for the rest of the colony. So in my opinion, putting homoso over your colony in the wintertime is the worst choice. Use something else if you, if you can. Um, and then, <clears throat> I went over the homoso and I'm wondering about things like this bee cozy. Now I noticed a really interesting um, way of wintering bees up in Canada. So up in Canada, folks have decided that they wanted to try keeping bees in a single deep and wintering them over. And the most interesting thing occurs they, they wait, they put them in these rows that there's plenty of space between them when they're gonna winter them. Then they wait for the snow to fall and they bury them completely in an igloo. So the, you know, and they, they showed people with shovels digging snow and burying them. So if you look at the bee yard, it's like 40 or 50 igloos, you know, with like, three feet of snow on top and three feet of snow all around. Now, we make sure that the snow is cleared from our entrances and that there's ways for our bees to get out of the colony. Not those bees. Those bees are in an igloo all winter. Now, when they cross section this igloo, the most incredible thing occurred. There was actually under that snow cap, there was an area of open space that developed. Even though they shoveled the snow all around it, right around the entrances was an open bubble. So there was a thin layer of snow and then a big area where the bees could come out and have cleansing flights right inside the comfort of that igloo. So I thought that was a pretty exceptional way um, that, that they have decided to over, they get very good success with burying their uh, colonies in completely in snow. You say, well, they wouldn't be able to breathe and all of that, but that's not the case. They survive. All right, now I don't know if this Bee Cozy product is a, um, 
has good R, R value or not. They're selling a lot of them. Um, but it does, looks like to me, it provides some um, wind protection. And so does that igloo, by the way, if you want to bury your colonies in snow this winter. I don't know if you want to do that, but uh, I'm dying to try it. We never get enough snow. Um, so this always gets me in trouble, this slide, because I can't prove the 25%. I know that 75% heat loss, on, this is how heat moves away from a lengths of rocks. 25% or so go out of the walls, 75% goes out of the top. Now, this is exactly the same. My, one of my former careers as a, as a uh, energy consultant and engineering, uh, was, that was when I was doing um, um, envelope uh, technology for, for uh, different, uh, as a consultant. I was called to design structures that, for energy efficiency. And the calculations were always 25, 75 for those, you know. So I was building wall structures or, or engineering wall structures that had uh, very little heat loss. But it was always this more insulation on top, less insulation on the side, because more heat rises. And it's obvious that more heat goes out of the top of a box. And the reason I show this in, in this talk is to let you know that um, even if you don't decide to do anything to help your bees with a little bit of insulation, some solid insulation on the top will go a long way to help protect the bees. And um, so here's some ex examples of people who have um, made little uh, covers to try to help um, insulate their bees. I don't particularly care for this one because there's too much wood around it. This one is almost, the way I'd like to see it, except I'd like to see this insulation go right from that edge to that edge. There's a leak here, a big crack. And, um, you know, again, if you're letting air out, you're always, um, you're always risking the, um, mitigating the quality of the R value of whatever material you're insulating for with. All right, so just wanted to show these. Um, now I was that when I was at, April Monday last year, I noticed that there's are all kinds. This is the Lyson, uh, the Polish hive. I met these Lyson brothers back in 2015 when they first came into the United States. I got three boxes from them and I ran them as experiments. They're, um, they're totally 100% insulated, the bottom, the top. Um, they clamp, the, there's a very tight seal between each box, they clamp them. <clears throat> shut with these clamps and you do have the option if you want to to ventilate them uh, you can pull those little black uh, squares out re rectangles out and they provide some insulation there's a screen bottom in here uh, that you can't see it's very ineffective and um, I stopped using them because they were they were too um, I didn't like the way that they matched the rest of the equipment in the colony in my yard this is something that folks have uh, tried this has a million and one little parts. It's like um, putting together a puzzle. It's like, almost like um, one of those little um, blocks that people use. Um, but it's a, it's a difficult, it comes in a big a, a hundred pieces and some people like them. I think they're very complicated and you have to devote yourself to an apiary with all, all of these. Um, because you know you don't you can't put a regular telescoping cover on them. I think they they take regular Hoffman frames inside, so that's fine. But I've I've mentored a couple of new beekeepers that started with this, and they ended up with Langstroth boxes or top bar hives or something else. Eventually, they gave up on these guys. Um, but you know it's a totally insulated box, and I'm not doing this justice because there's like five or six um, insulated insulation boxes out there from this. The Russians made a beautiful box. Out of, the outside is stainless steel and squeezed between layers of stainless steel is a big thick layer of insulation. And you know, Russian winters, I guess, can be cold. Um, I couldn't get much out of them at April and Monday because they didn't speak English. And um, uh, so, but they had uh, their boxes there. There was Polish boxes there. There were boxes from, uh, all parts of Eastern Europe, and they're all getting in this game of making totally insulated colonies to run 
for beekeepers to run year round. All right, so um, with that, let me um, let me uh, stop this program. I'm at the end of it, and um, so now you can see um, the, these. You know a little bit more about what's going on with these colonies. They're covered with snow a little bit, but those are um, condensing away all winter time, and um, are came up. These particular colonies have survived in that location. I get very high survival in this location. I get somewhere around um, 75 or 80% survival. I lose 20% or some years 30, but, but uh, mostly I get really good survival. And bees come out into the, into the spring, really healthy looking. So I'm gonna end this slideshow and then I'll take some questions. All right. Well, the chat's loaded. Were there any questions in there, Tom? Uh, so, Bill, one of the questions was, how much insulation do you put above your, um, at the top of your hive, and do you do that above or below the inner cover, or do you remove the inner cover entirely during the winter? Oh, I take the inner cover entirely off during the winter. So um, I run a, about an inch of insulation, so I run about R7 on the top and R7 on the sides. Okay. But it's completely airtight. That sleeve you see, you saw, runs up and touches the insulation on the telescoping cover. So I had to build, in my case, I built special telescoping covers that are wider than a conventional telescoping cover so they could accept the sleeve. But you don't have to do that. If you wanted to run a sleeve on the outside of your, um, colony, you can uh, buy a BMAX top cover and they'll fit it. That one inch, of, one, inf, one inch of insulation all around, a BMAX cover goes right over the top. So does that answer that? Yes. Looking through the questions. Um, if anyone else has any questions, you can go ahead and un unmute yourself and ask rather than putting it in the chat. Yeah, that's much better. Do you use a screen bottom board or a solid bottom board? Well, I use a screen bottom board, but I put a, um, a I, cut, I, I close it in the winter time. I put a, I slide a piece of Luan plywood in there and it just blocks the um, bottom. Okay. Deja, I saw that you um, well, I, I, I have two ape in my hives and I'm, okay. I'm new to that this year. Um, I'm actually pretty excited about it because the insulation is great. They go together, they latch together beautifully. Um, the insulation's already there. The yes. feeders are interesting the way they go. I don't use the feeders for the springtime, but I'm using them for the winter time and my question is the way the feeder, I don't know if, how familiar you are, but there's these plastic kind of, you know, top covers where the feed can go in. And then there's a little bit of space before you have the outer cover. And then there's plenty of like airflow for air to go out. So it's an insulated um, outer cover, but there's kind of a, it's a, I guess if you think about it, the inner, cavity hits the plastic top and that might be cold mm. so if they're heating anything the heat will rise to that plastic top which i cut some holes in which they can go up and eat some more feed but then there's a little more space before the big fat insulated cover knowing what i know about engineering i question whether that's a good design yeah i mean that's i don't really know um I, I, I followed you, I followed along with you, sort of could visualize that. So you do have a total cover of insulation on the top though. Yes. And, it meets, like, and it meets I, the sidewall, right? R, everything's R9, the sides and the top. Yeah, but and they meet. The inner cover where you can feed them, if the heat of the um, colony rises up, it hits this plastic top, which would be the inner cover. And then there's this, dead space between that and the real outer cover. Yeah, no, that's not a problem, I don't think. I don't, I think that that's fine. 
because and I had a sugar, so it can it can absorb moisture also. Yeah. Um, um, so, what kind of sugar did you use? Uh, just white sugar. You just made a cake, sugar cake, put it in. Well, there? you know, I haven't quite gotten ready yet. I can do one of three things right now for experimenting with it because it's my first year. I just poured a little plain white sugar just to see, you know, what they're going to do with it. I also have fondant ready and ready to go, but I could also whip them out and pour in, you know, my own fondant and then put it in with a whole lot of it in there. Yeah. I, have, I haven't really settled in for the winter. That's why I'm. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, well, so, you know, I mean, so look, I, I suggest you run them and observe what you, you know, what happens and then, um, you know, uh, report back to your club, let them know. But I would suggest that you don't put fondant in there. And you might, and you might want to know why, because, why? Um, well, when you heat fond, when you heat sugar up to that soft ball stage to make um, fondant, you might know that you make a chemical called HMF, hydroxy. I heard, yes, I heard of that. Huh? I've, I've, I've heard of that. Yeah, that's hydroxymethanolfurfanol. So that's a poison to bees. So yeah. I've, you know, again, I, before I researched that and before I became aware of the fact that that chemical is produced when you make fondant um, and, and the fact that, and that can poison some of your bees, we, we do know that there are some bees that eat fondant that do have to metabolize that poison. So the question is whether or not you wanna feed them that. Um, that's again, that's part of this oral tradition of beekeeping before anybody knew that that chemical was actually produced. When you is make- white sugar better? What, white sugar is much better. And by the way, you don't have to work with anything hot. Right, you can make white sugar just with a little bit, you know, a pound of sugar and seven or eight ounces of water. Keep mixing them into a little cake, pat it flat, let it dry overnight, and bring it out into your colony. Oh, and just don't heat it, but make kind of a a, a little a bit patty. of a patty. Yeah, Abijah, we have a couple of recipes on the club website for right. making oh, essentially candy boards. It's just a little bit of liquid uh, and ten pounds of sugar. So maybe yeah. a cup of liquid. So you're not heating it up at all. Great. The ooze are the what we recommend. We don't recommend the um, fondant. So yeah. it's way it's too late to be feeding any syrup at this point, correct? Sure is. That's okay. That's what I thought. And is anybody opening up their hives anymore to check on anything, or are we all done? So Bijou, uh, we're we're going to stick with this right now. On right. Thursday night, we're having a club meeting <laughs> for general right. questions and answers. So you can follow up. Uh, tonight we have a limited time with Bill, so okay, we're going to stick with Bill right now. Thanks. Um, we're going to move on to the next question. Um, Phil had a question about using a an infrared camera. Yes. Bill, yes. And he asked about if you see the temperature drop below seventy degrees of the cluster, does that indicate that the 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 colony could be dying and headache or headed for trouble if the cluster temperatures below 70 degrees. Yes, that's an indication that there's, that cluster is probably headed for a little bit of trouble. Yeah, Okay. so once it gets to where it can't produce heat anymore, it slowly runs out of um, resources and dies. So yeah, if you're getting in the 60 degree range and all that, it won't take long for that colony to um, expire. Now, if you're reading the temperature off that infrared camera, if you're reading reading that temperature, you have to make sure you're actually, you know, getting the right reading from your IR camera. It has to be set up right. So, you know, you don't want to, but you can use it as a baseline, you know, find something that you know of a known temperature and then make sure that your, temp, your, um, your camera's reading off because they'll give you both a visual and they'll give you a heat. You know, they'll actually, um, there's a formula they, that the camera does and it gives you the actual heat signature, you know, in, in uh, terms of um, temperature, Fahrenheit. So yeah, uh, so, so it, don't go below okay. 70. Sure. Next question, if I um, use foil-faced insulation, yeah. should that be facing the, the outside or towards the inside of the colony? So okay, on so top and on the sides? 
Wonderful. So I'm sorry, th these have all been wonderful questions, by the way. This one is particularly nice <laughs> because I forgot to talk about that. But um, I, I made reference to this uh, foil-faced insulation as the best one. This has foil on both sides. The one I'm showing you, I showed you tonight, the polyisocyanate, the one inch. Um, and so when foil is facing the bees with a little bit of space between the bee and the foil, it will reflect back IR. So we used to, in uh, building envelopes, we would build structures that all they had was foil in them to reflect IR back out into the atmosphere. For attics, sometimes that's all you use between the attic bays are thin piece of foil. So yes, if you wanna recover some IR heat, which is an unexplored area, in our beekeeping. No one really knows much about this. And um, I run it all the time that way because I know that a little bit of IR heat that would have normally escaped into the atmosphere can be bounced back onto the bees if the foil is facing them. Okay, thank you. I, could I ask one more question? So do you run a ventilating hive in the summer and then a condensing <laughs> hive in the winter? Now, I don't ventilate ever, and I leave my uh, insulated top covers on all year round. So I do take the sleeve off, but the only reason I take the sleeve off is because then I have, I wouldn't be able to manage the boxes if I left the sleeve on because it's a full sleeve goes over both boxes because I'm using double deeps. But if I had a, you know, sign and I want to get into that box and see what's in those boxes and see what's going on. So I have to take the sleeve off. So one, every, Early in the spring, I removed the sleeves, but not for reasons of um, temperature control or insulation, but just because it's practical, not practical to operate boxes with the sleeve on all the time. I have too many of them to try to do that. I guess if you were, um, if you only had a few colonies, you could leave the sleeve on all year long, or you could run an insulated box, like there's plenty of them on the market. Sure, I uh, had a question about your exact hive configuration. Yeah. So bottom board, et cetera, et cetera. Bottom screen, bottom board, two brood supers, and then um, honey supers, or two brood boxes, you might call them. We call them, the old school calls them honey uh, brood supers, but those would be deeps. And mm -hmm. then um, then uh, whatever I want for, uh, for, if I'm not manipulating a colony using some kind of a um, swarm control, I'll just run my supers on top of that. I always run queen excluders. And, um, and then insulated top cover all year round. Okay. I use a three inch opening. I leave that three inch opening all year round. I never change that. Um, you know, mouse guards in the winter. What else? Um, that's about it. And I try to keep it all standard. So, you know, I, I've, cause I got mounds of equipment and I wanna be able to use them on any hive I need to use them on. Sure. I had a question. Do you, do you tip your hives forward so the water um, runs out and doesn't accumulate? Do you see water uh, at the bottom on your bottom board? Um, no. Well, so I have screen bottoms, so I never see water in them. But my screen bottoms are from, um, they call them the Freeman small hive beetle boards. Yep. I made a bunch of them. I bought one from Jerry Freeman. And then, um, and then I made them in my shop. So they have a tray that slides in underneath them. Mm -hmm. And that tray will fill with water when they're, when they're um, curing honey. Okay. And, and also um, during the winter, I guess some, I don't ever see it in the winter, but there's probably some moisture that ends up getting down there in the winter also. Okay. But it doesn't get full of water. And I don't, I don't have to tilt mine because I, I run that screen all the time. Sure. Uh, Dave, you had a question? I do. Thanks, Bill. Great information. Um, <laughs> my question is, you mentioned the entrances, they tend to propolize down. And I was wondering if you just start out with the smallest size entrance reducer, is that too small for them? The one inch? The, you, know, the, you know, the less the than, one... it's like three quarters of an inch, isn't it? Yeah, that the yeah I, I refer to that as an as an inch. 
I make all the mine. So sometimes they come out to be an inch, sometimes they're three quarters. And then I put the long slot in on the opposite way so I can flip them around. The only time I use that one inch is when I um, are trying to, you know, if I've got a robbing situation or something and I need to throttle the entrance down so the colony can guard. Otherwise I run the three inch all the time. So I closed, all, I closed all mine down to the one inch for winter and tipped them forward. So yeah. I, should probably, I should probably get in there and change that to the next wider one, three inch. Um, it won't, it, it's not gonna hurt your bees to run the one inch in the winter time. The only problem is, so you're gonna get a bunch of bees that die over the winter, they fall off that cluster, right? You're gonna go into the, let's say we go into the, uh, like right now, a lot of my bees have nine frames of bees one of my boxes are nine frames of bees. So I've got, you know, colonies that have 25,000 bees in them, say, or 20,000 bees. So 10,000 of those bees are going to die over the winter time. And some of them will fall on the bottom board. The problem with a one inch opening is you don't want to get, if that's your only opening, hopefully it is, you have to make sure that's clean all the time by putting a stick or, or some kind of a hook in there and making sure you're dragging all the dead bees out. Because you can get into a situation where bees die and cover that slot. Then I have uh, slatted, slatted racks on the bottom. I thought that might help. Well, they still won't, be, they can't get out of a slotted rack though. But you know how that the, there's like a, a board on the face of the slatted rack that's covering the top of that entrance. I figured the bees would die and fall on top of that. They, Part. yeah, that could, that could be the case, yeah. That, and that, then um, I have, uh, I'm in the construction business, so I have a bunch of foil line, two inch Thermax, and I figured that would be two inches two. perfect. And then, uh, so replace the the top cover with the Thermax and strap it down, and you're good to go. Yeah, or put a piece of plywood over it, you know, so you don't have to strap right on top of that because it'll crush it a little. Yeah. You know, put something on the top so that um, you know. But and that's will tipping it forward help the moisture run forward to the hive uh, away yeah. from the cluster? Uh, yeah, you don't you don't have to worry about that moisture in the bottom. Okay. You know, but if your if your colony is level or tilt a little forward. If you want to tilt a little forward, that's fine. I keep mine level so that when I heft them to try to figure out how much food they have, I'm not creating a, a mechanical advantage in any way and being fooled by the weight of the colony. I you know, so I make sure that they're level in my case. I also figured with the one inch uh, opening, I wouldn't need a mouse guard. Is that true? Oh, no, that's not true. They'll nope. get in the one inch. They'll, they open it up. Oh, okay. And get that mouse guards on now because um, I'm sorry to say, but uh, you know bees have um, mice have been looking for a home for the last couple of weeks. So, you know, get him on there. All right. Yep. Thank you, sir. Okay. So, uh, two questions uh, following up regarding the sleeve that you put around your uh, the length trough box. How yeah. do you hold the the sides together? All how, right. How so, you... all right. Let me show you the. Um, let me share you that share that screen again. All right, you, do you see this shiny yep. area here? Can you see that? Mm -hmm. That's tape. So that's just um, uh, the industry foil tape that you use for HVAC. That's all okay. you need. It sticks like crazy, and um, it it also um, you can. You can cut it one side, and this is hard to follow, but think of, imagine this box all four sides taped. You can take a drywall knife or something that you have and slice one side at the seam, and you can lay the whole thing back down flat for winter, for summer storage if you want to take it off. You don't have to store the box in that condition. You can store it like that. I have plenty of room, so I store them fully assembled. But if I didn't, I would slice that one corner. Then you just put another piece of tape on it in the, in the spring when you put it back together. I mean, in the fall when you put it back together. Sure. Excellent. So um, I, I think there's some confusion with some of our members. They're asking about uh, what happens to the top entrance. And with your hives, you don't have a top entrance. No top You don't have any sort of vent at all. No. You just have it fully insulated right. on five sides. So you have yes. the top and the four sides. Right. And the sides and the top, the insulation touches. Mm -hmm. So it's a, if you were to turn it upside down, you would see foil all over the place. 
there wouldn't be any wood showing anywhere. Excellent. Okay, I think that's the last of the questions from the chat. If anybody else has any questions, you can speak up now or forever hold your peace until next month when uh, Bill talks about, um, let's see now, we have you down for uh, two queen colonies and then uh, mating flights or, or, or uh, bee flight patterns, correct? Well, the, the next one is um, honeybee flight and, and sexual reproduction. Okay. So that's one of my, um, that's that particular one, um, less controversial than this talk, <laughs> but, <laughs> but um, uh, <clears throat> read my article in Bee Culture um, for, I wrote two articles, one in Bee Culture, one of American Bee Journal. And um, uh, so read both, you can read that one if you want more information about winter and colonies, or you can just send me some email. I put my um, wing dance site up on the chat there. Yep. And you can send you can send me messages there if you want also. Excellent. I'm, I'm and... looking forward to coming back and giving you that talk. I think I think you'll really enjoy that one. It's mostly visual. Yeah. And uh, there's lots of videos in it and um, uh, no disease. I'm not talking about disease on this trip. Yeah. Which is good. <laughs> yeah. All right. Wonderful. Excellent. Okay. Thank you, everyone. So before we go, before we go, uh, two announcements. First announcement is that this Thursday, we are having our second lecture. Uh, Peter Freichman will be talking on a related, uh, sort of expanding on what Bill spoke about. He'll talk about humidity and um, I think humidity and temperature control in hives. So it's a nice pairing with uh, Bill's talk from tonight. And then following Peter's uh, presentation, we're gonna have a regular question and answer period for um, members and then a short business meeting. And then this coming um, in two weeks, two Saturdays from today is the Mass B annual conference. So our club is hosting and Phil Thomas and John Cheatham have put a tremendous amount of work into the November 7th Mass B meeting. And it's an on, a totally online meeting from 8 a.m. to noon, followed by a vendor and speaker Q&A from 12 to one. So it's, um, we highly recommend it. We have got some great speakers and we'll talk a little bit more about it on Thursday, but just wanted to put that into everyone, that be in everyone's bonnet for tonight. So if you have any, questions you can reach out to bill oh uh we'll get your we'll get his email out to you um on the club website or in an email and we look forward to having bill again next month and i hope to see everyone again this thursday so take care everyone i'll close out this meeting have a good night it's a great it was a great group i i'm, I'm honored to speak to you guys uh, can't wait till next month see you later excellent Thanks, Bill. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, good night. Thank you. Thank you.